going to talk about novel therapies in TMA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, before we start, we really want to hear, oops, did, did this not get cleared out? Uh, we want to hear from our audience if you could tell us um, your treatment choice for complement-mediated TMA. Is it EQ that you want to use every two weeks? Is it ravulizumab every eight weeks? Are you looking, um, and then I think it says, um, I rarely use anti-complement therapy. This is for current what's available to us. Okay, and we're going to hear about a lot of the new novel therapies, but just for um, curiosity, uh, what kind of drug do you prefer for your patients? Would you prefer an IV drug every two to eight weeks, an oral therapy, subcutaneous injection, or does it depend on patient choice and compliance? So sub-Q injection is out. Okay. Me oh, there is one subcutaneous self-injection, several for oral, um, intravenous, and depends on patient. Okay. And, um, and then last question is, I'm happy with current regimens because C5 has been a game changer. Yes, I'm happy, but we need additional regimens. No, I'm not happy we need additional regimens. Okay. All right, that fits nicely with what we're going to talk about, we are going to talk about everything that's coming in the pipeline. So here we go. Yes, yes, yes. All right, thank you for having me. I'm very humbled to be here among a lot of experts in this field. Um, today, I'm going to talk about novel therapies and TMA. Um, I think a lot of it has already started. We've had a little bit of appetizer of kind of a lot of the things we're going to discuss, so thank you for that. Um, this, these are my disclosures. So for TMA, the goal of therapy is like anything else that we treat. So we want to maximize efficacy of our treatment while we minimize side effects. Um, we want to target the specific part of the complement system to have the most impact, um, but we also want to narrow our therapeutics to minimize side effects, namely infection. Um, there is a lot that goes on when we think about complement drug development, which makes it a little bit difficult. Um, first, like we know, complement is constitutively active with hydrolysis of C3 spontaneously. Um, we also know that complement activation affects a lot of different diseases from lupus to TMA um, to C3GN. And so um, some have different degrees of complement activation. So knowing exactly where to target is difficult. And then additionally, um, I really like this diagram. It's from the KDGO's Complement Controversies Conference. Um, but as we all know, there's multiple potential intervention sites. So targeting exactly what the optimal intervention site is can sometimes be muddy, um, although could be very opportunistic. Um, and I'm going to continue to use this diagram throughout my talk just to kind of to target exactly where we are in the complement system. Um, so I'm going to start with eculizumab, and while it potentially may not be quite novel, um, it really was a game changer in the field of um, TMA and atypical HUS. Um, it was first approved for atypical HUS in 2011. 
um, although it was approved before that in 2007 for PNH. Um, it does bind the N terminal of the alpha chain, which is important, um, but we all know has a very short half-life. It needs to be dosed IV every one to two weeks. Um, anything that is read in this talk are areas that might be a little bit novel for that drug, um, but there are trials and manuscripts um, published for spacing. Uh, eculizumab based on PK modeling. This is slightly less relevant um, in the world of ravulizumab, but still important. Um, we all know the side effects with a lot of these anti-C5 inhibitors. Um, it's the infection with encapsulated organisms, the meningitis risk that's about 2,000-fold. Um, other side effects and pitfalls is there are eculizumab non-responders, um, especially those with specific genetic mutations, as well as those um, with the polymorphisms in the alpha chain of C5, namely a, a cohort of, or a subset of the Asian population. Um, the longer-acting brother of eculizumab is ravulizumab. It was FDA-approved in 2018. Um, it's a C5 inhibitor and capitalizes on a histidine switch in eculizumab, which preserves binding um, to C5 in the serum, but essentially um, allows the antibody to be taken up in the acidic endosome, where um, it binds to neonatal FC receptors, and then is placed back into circulation, which favors antibody recycling. It's dosed every four to eight weeks, depending on patient size. Half-life is about 52 days. It is also given IV, although there are currently clinical trials ongoing for subcutaneous dosing, um, depending on whether you think that's better or not for your patient. Um, and side effects are similar to aculizumab. So crevalimab is currently in phase three trials. It's a C5 inhibitor, but affects the C5 beta chain. Um, so it's effective in those patients with the C5 alpha mutation, like I was mentioning, the cohort of the, the Asian population. Um, it uses that SMART, the sequential monoclonal antibody recycling technology, which allows the antibody to be taken in the acidic endosome, detached and placed back in the, in the serum. Um, and so the, it requires one loading dose that's IV, and then it's subcutaneous, dosed every two to four weeks. Um, and the one thing I like to highlight, because I am a pediatric nephrologist, so um, trials in pediatrics are, are near and dear to me, um, the current phase three trials are going down to patients who are 28 days of age. Um, side effects are the same as eculizumab and ravulizumab. There have been reports of headache as well as urticaria, which is thought to be due to um, complexes of the drug into the skin. Um, some dismoran is also an anti-C5, um, but it, instead of it being a monoclonal antibody, it's an RNA interference therapeutic, so it suppress suppresses hepatic production of C5. I apologize, my slides are a little bit messy, but um, the... the Unfortunately, there's also extra hepatic C5 production, um, so likely this drug will need to be used in combination, potentially with C5 inhibition for with eculizumab or ravulizumab, but may allow for lower antibody needs, so spacing of duration of dosing or less dosing. Um, Simdismaran is subcutaneous and is phase, in phase two trials right now for IgA nephropathy as well as atypical HUS. I just want to briefly talk about STEC HUS. Um, there have been a couple double blind control trials, the ACU-LISHU trial looking at kidney outcomes and the ACU-STEC looking at the overall severity and improvements in STEC HUS. Um, both of them have been sort of hampered by lack of clear benefit, um, as well as there's been reports of hepatotoxicity, which has halted some of these studies. Um, and then in Argentina, they're also investigating a drug that doesn't currently have um, a real name, but it's called INM004, um, and it's a shiga antitoxin hyperimmune immunoglobulin that's derived from an equine source, and it's in phase three double-blind studies um, in pediatric patients down to nine months. Um, so to move a little bit up the complement chain and talk about proximal inhibition is pegcetacoplin, which is a C3 and C3B inhibitor, so it inhibits the formation of C3 convertase. Um, as a result, it blocks all three complement pathways, so alternative classical and lectin. It's given subcutaneously twice a week. Um, currently in phase three studies for IgA nephropathy and C3GN um, in patients down to 12 years of age. 
It still has the same infection risk with encapsulated organisms, although to date there haven't been reports of an increased risk um, despite binding all three or despite halting all three parts of the complement cascade. Um, Avacopan is a C5A receptor inhibitor. So C5A, I think, as we know, is not um, a further trigger of complement cascade, um, but is a promoter of neutrophil chemotaxis, degranulation, um, endothelial damage, and vascular permeability. The nice thing about avacopan um, is that the early and terminal complement systems remain intact. So there's no need for antibiotic prophylaxis with penicillin or, or vaccination. The other nice thing about avacopan is that it's given orally, it's given um, twice a day, which is pretty frequent dosing, and has already been approved by the FDA for Inca vasculitis based on the clear classic and advocate studies. It's in phase two trials for atypical HUS at this point. Um, it's also looking at in studies for IgA nephropathy, C3 glomerular nephritis. Side effects, because it is FDA approved, have been well reported. Um, you can see all of the side effects that have been reported here. Although going head to head with steroids, the steroid toxic toxicity is actually reported as worse than the side effects from, um, from this med. Um, the other thing that we sort of hinted on other meds earlier as well, um, like iptocopin, is that there is a delayed therapeutic effect. It does not halt the complement cascade and the soluble MAC from forming, and so it's not a medication that we would use in an acute setting with a patient with um, severe complement activation. I'm just going to glance over um, vilabelumab, which is also an anti-C5A antibody, currently not under investigation for TMA, but I think it highlights the um, inflammatory kind of effects of C5. It's FDA approved currently under emergency use authorization for COVID-19, which we know is an inflammatory cytokine cascade um, kind of disease, and so currently um, using vilabelumab for that. Um, iptocopin is called a factor B inhibitor, but its actual functional target is the BB fragment of the convertase, and as a result, it blocks C3 and C5 convertase, and it just prevents the amplification of the classical pathway and the lectin pathway, but it doesn't truly block the pathways, although um, vaccination is, is still recommended. It's an oral med um, to be given twice a day and is in phase two and phase three trials. Uh, for atypical HUS, membranous nephropathy. It's approved for IgA nephropathy currently, and then also uh, lupus. And enrollment for C3 glomerular nephritis is down to 12 years of age. It's also being investigated in phase three trials for atypical HUS for patients who are naive to complement inhibition, so those who have not had aculizumab or rapulizumab. Danacopin is a, also a factor inhibitor anti-factor D. It inhibits the cleavage of factor B into BA and BB. It's also an oral med given twice a day. The, it's in phase two studies for C3GN. The problem with Danacopin to date is that they're having a hard time getting adequate serum levels for alternative pathway inhibition for a sustained period of time. Um, but potentially could be an add-on therapy for um, with C5 inhibitors because C5 inhibitors prevent the formation of the membrane attack complex. This works more proximally um, and, and prevents opsonization, and so working on two different mechanisms of the complement pathway. And then just to close with talking about TATMA, um, I think when we talk about therapies, we also need to talk about preventative measures. I will say I am not an oncologist, um, but I know HLA match transplantation is, um, is standard of care, if possible, avoidance of mTOR inhibitors, and then vigorous infection control to prevent damage of the endothelium. Um, we sort of already alluded, but withdrawal of CNIs um, is controversial at this time. Um, we know that um, withdrawal of CNIs, um, that we know that CNIs can induce endothelial damage, so increases thromboxane E2 synthesis, decreases prostacyclin production, and inhibits nitric oxide synthase. Uh, but withdrawal of CNIs can also increase the risk of graft versus host disease, and to date, withdrawal has not shown to improve survival in studies. 
in terms of treatment of TA, TMA, standard of care is currently eculizumab. As we were mentioning before, the complement cascade with um, TA, TMA is very high. And so I'll we often need higher doses to obtain therapeutic effects. Mm -hmm. Some centers follow trough levels of eculizumab or follow CH50 levels, especially in patients who are non-responders. Defibrotide is not standard of care, but there's thought to be potentially prophylaxis abilities of defibrotide because it decreases procoagulant activity and increases fibrinolytic properties. So it could, and it could also protect the endothelium from CNI toxicity. IL-2 inhibitors are also not currently standard of care, but thought to potentially be an adjunct as well to TATMA treatment. And further proximal blockage of uh, the complement system may also be effective, so peg is also being investigated. Nomocopin is currently in phase three trials that are administratively complete for TATMA and pediatrics that are uh, half a year to 18 years and greater than five kilos. Nomocopin is a C5 inhibitor, but also a leukotriene B4 inhibitor. It's derived from a hematophagous tick. Um, it doesn't, it also overcomes that C5 resistance that eculizumab and rapulizumab have. And the nice thing about nomocopin is that it blocks both the complement cascade, but also blocks the cytokine storm, which may be really effective in TATMA with the leukotriene inhibition. And then the last drug I'm going to talk about is nersoplamab, um, which is a man and bind and lectin inhibitor. So the, the classical pathway and the alternative pathway remained intact, and there's no effect on adaptive immunity. This drug is given weekly IV. Um, it's currently in phase three studies for IgA nephropathy as well as atypical HUS, but has been approved by the FDA for breakthrough therapy design for TATMA based on a pivotal trial. Um, and is often used, used in compassionate use. It's given once weekly for four to eight weeks. Um, and I'll just briefly show you the pivotal trials. So there were 17 patients, so a pretty small cohort, completing the study for eight weeks. And they found that 61% of patients were responders to nersoplamab. Um, 61 had improvement in TMA markers, as you can see here, and then 74% had improvement in organ function. Of the responders, 94% had survival to 100 days based on 60%, 68% for the non-responders. Um, and it's a little bit hard to look at adverse events in this population as TATMA itself is associated with a lot of um, mortality and morbidity, um, although they did show that about probably 10 of the adverse events out of 27 were associated with, um, with the drug itself. So I think we're gonna have a lot of discussion about these meds, but in conclusion, there's multiple clinical trials that are underway for novel TMA therapeutics. A tailored approach to the mechanism of disease will be ideal once we're at that point. We are developing medications that may be more user-friendly, maybe able to use, you'd be used at home, be used orally, and potentially have less infectious risk. With the drugs we currently have, we can consider tailoring the dosing to of available meds, especially eculizumab and rabulizumab, and indication for expansion for currently approved drugs is critical. Thank you. Thank you, that was an excellent overview. I'm gonna request our, all our panelists to come up front for this one because we wanna hear from everybody. And while that's happening, I, I curious to hear from our audience. You all answered that, yes, you're happy with the current regimens, but you want additional regimens. So what is it that you're looking for in additional drugs? Just feel free to raise a hand and speak up. While well, we'll have the panelists come up. What, what is it that um, is needed in the, in the field in terms of treatment? Is the route of administration efficacy? What is it that concerns you all? Yes, Christoph. Access. That's true. Um, the current drugs are not available in several countries, at least I know, and I see if I have any other concerns.
All right, we'll come to the audience questions in a bit. So I'm gonna start with our panelists' questions. The first is what factors, suppose all of these, well, before I even bring up, um, is there a specific drug or drugs that you all are most excited about that is in trials? And, and anybody feel free to pick up the mic and answer. All them. Oh, okay, all right. Suppose all these drugs get approved and they're available to us. What factors will go into deciding which drug you will use for your patient? I guess I earned that, huh? Um, I think it'll be uh, patient-dependent factors. I mean, I think an oral therapy um, is probably um, the most patient-friendly, but it will depend on adherence. It will depend on uh, uh, right-sizing the pharmacokinetics. Um, I think a subcutaneous therapy is also going to be a major advance. Um, in a the, sub-Q they can give themselves? Yes, right? yeah. So... Um, where uh, an infusion center uh, is no longer needed for, for treatment. So I think it will depend on, on the patient characteristics ultimately. Do you think would genetics play a role in deciding which drug you use? Richard and Matthew, I would pick yeah. you on those two questions. I think genetics will. I think this is a very cool time because I think it offers an opportunity for Decision medicine at the at the patient level, if there's a large number of drugs to choose from, where we can match the patient's disease profile, the exact type of disease, the complement profile, the genetics with the right patient. Any other thoughts on genetics and treatment? Yeah, Matthew. But I, <clears throat> it will be more a question for Meredith. Uh, because it seems like we're taking the approach of developing inhibitors that are usually, you know, molecular antibodies and whatnot, or, or compounds that will inhibit different factors. But most of them are made in liver. And the obvious question is why isn't there any sRNA or gene editing being discussed? You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 you probably have treated pri primary hyperxoria type 1 with the, the macerant or the deserant. Amazing. Liver mops up everything. And I can tell you what's coming is gene editing for those tar same targets with Arbor, therapeutics and whatnot. Absolutely amazing. Like we, we now do kidney alone transplant when we needed a liver before. So uh, have you read anything about this or is this just not like are we... We, we've got beautiful targets. They're made in the liver. Liver is a perfect organ. So I don't know if you want to comment. No, I mean, I haven't read much about it. The only thing I'll say is, you know, there is still extra hepatic production. But to your point, in PH1, there's also extra hepatic production, um, you know, and extra hepatic places that you process oxalate. So, yeah, I haven't read much. I don't know um, if you know much about it. I think there is um, RNA editing technologies um, specifically for complement media diseases that are in early phase development. With the gene editing that you mentioned, Matthew, are there any concerns that there could be off-target effects like you know you would expect? What is what does that concern you at all? So the, most of the companies that do, you're talking about gene editing, yeah. like knocking out, let's say, a mutant, mm -hmm. whichever gene. Uh, so a lot of the companies that do this, they use a custom design CAS, whichever number, 12. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about CAS 9 anymore. Mm -hmm. Well beyond that, completely engineered with basic, and they do whole genome sequencing, and they see essentially almost no... Um, off target if you talk about other parts of the genome. And uh, so, and if, and if you go beyond the liver, well, you, then you're targeting the same gene elsewhere. So that, that's fine. Um, the, and now the other thing is the delivery vehicles used to be viral based, and then you get this strong immune reaction. So if you need to redose, that's a problem. But now more and more they're moving to lipid nanoparticles which allow for multiple infusions if, if necessary. For sRNA-based, 
or gene editing. So I think it's, it's going to be the way of future. And probably what will happen is we're, we're going to be able to use these compounds to map out in a precision health fashion, like Richard is saying, which genes precisely would be Not the dead. best target for this patient, uh, because it, it's such complex biology. So that's, I think, what's coming. But a lot of, lot of these mutations are uh, loss of function. So what are we going to be doing with gene editing for those? I, I just wanted to follow up on that thought. You know, all, all of the inhibitors that we're using now are either antibodies or they block activity. And so we're really at the first generation of complement inhibitors, and there's a, a bunch more coming down the pike that are, that are uh, offering increased regulation, like lots of variations on factor H, um, maybe. Well, I mean, on factor H, there's actually a group looking at a piece of factor H and then targeting it to the, to the you know, organ. I look forward to seeing what that does because then you're not trying to systemically. If you looked at the levels of some of these antibody-based drugs, the amount of antibody it takes to be efficacious doesn't make sense. It's so high. So we're clearly doing something else with these drugs. So I think looking at a targeted to the organ, to where the complement activation is going on could be very powerful in the future. So something I think you mentioned, uh, from what I recall, there was an SCR1 through 4 of factor H with the anti-C5. There, there was that combination drug coming together, right? Um, so, so um, you know, we, we talked about it just a little while ago. We all think of TMAs as, you know, the MAG, the endothelial, more terminal. What do you, I mean, you, some of you have mentioned, what do you think about the proximal inhibitors? Like, what, where will they play a role? Will they play a role in TMAs? What do you think will be there as a target for TMA? How do you see those drugs? Meredith, you want to take it since? I think we alluded to this earlier, but I think especially in those patients where we don't see a lot of terminal complement activation, they may be a good medication to have on hand um, just to see. And, and then I think, you know, we also have to think of other disease processes, like something like C3GN. Um, we do try rabulizumab, eculizumab in these patients, but probably if we can target exactly where the disease process is, may be more effective. Do you envision something like if, if there is a concern, of course, we don't know what the trials will show, but if there is a concern that they don't work in the acute phase, do you see them more as a maintenance therapy for some of these patients? Yeah, I, I do, or I, I think of them also as potentially could be an adjunct as well, um, you know, especially in patients where we're not seeing full, we're seeing improvement with some of the medications that we have, but not full improvement. That could also just be an adjunct and try to kind of block different parts of the complement pathway. Yeah, similar to what they've done for PNH, although somehow we haven't seen a lot of that breakthrough in TMA, but for sure we've seen that in PNH. What about the biosimilars? Do you think... Um, if they become available, and to Christoph's question, you know, about the access, the, the cost, how is that going to change things? I invite you to my Thursday afternoon presentation. <laughs> um, actually, so sneak preview, but um, the Samsung uh, uh, C5 inhibitor and the um, Amgen biosimilar were both approved earlier this year for AHUS, so there's definitely more C5 inhibitors on the market Are now. they available in the U.S., Brad? I know they're in the U.K. and some other countries. The EMA approval was last year, and then July and May of this year, um, they were both um, FDA approved. How widely available they are is a different story, I think, but they at least have regulatory approval. Do you know what they're going to be cost-wise? I do not. Um, we also kind of talked about this a little bit. How do you, um, sorry, go ahead, you had something? Oh, no, it was just, I was asking when the, when they are, when the patent is officially out for Echoismab. I think it's understand. next year. It is out now, so we could. So it is available to order, is that what you're saying? Or not, I'll be done. I mean, I would have to say, um, I would, expect the um, insurance industry to lead the charge, uh, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, 
I mean, I mean, I think the studies, um, again, sneak preview for my talk on Thursday, but there is um, published evidence of safety and efficacy comparable to eculizumab of these two biosimilars in PNH. There are no studies in uh, complement mediated TMA, but there's at least some um, rigorously reviewed uh, evidence that they're um, safe and effective. All right, and I know we talked about this a little bit as well. How do you monitor your patients who are on therapy? What kind of testing do you use? I know, um, Stephanie, you were a big proponent of EQ levels. CH50 has been mentioned, C5B9 levels. Anybody wants to take about what do you use to monitor your patients to make sure they're adequately responding? And do you monitor them? And is it in the acute phase? Do you monitor them all the time while they're on therapy? What's the practice like? Uh, ugh. I, it just depends. I mean, I tend to monitor whatever was abnormal. So in my C3 patients, my C3GM patients, you, and I monitor their C3 breakdown products. And I, you know, like as I'm trying different therapies, it's one more marker of like, do I have any semblance of control <laughs> over this or not? Um, or is anyone else? And do you want do you monitor them in the acute time, like the first few weeks when you started, or do you keep keep it going? For I I keep going. Okay. I just because it, it yeah, and I and it, and there's also there's just so much right. We we don't even understand what the trigger is, right? But something triggered this. I don't know if they're going to be triggered again. I don't know how I would know, right? Especially the insidious ones, right? Mm -hmm. The teenagers who show up hypertensive and they suddenly have CKD3, right? And you're like, you didn't know before, so how would I know now? <laughs> so it, it kind of makes you a little bit crazy. So I, I just monitor everything all of the time to a certain extent. <laughs> I think Brad, I mean, I trained under Brad, so. <laughs> so so something beyond just the hemoglobin and platelets, right? You're talking yes. about the and it's, it's typically whatever, Whatever Initially, was abnormal, abnormal, what is, like, I'm targeting my, what I'm monitoring to what was what, abnormal. What, tar what started the treatment exactly. to begin with. Okay. I, I guess I would echo that, that I do um, monitor, even in, like, convalescence, when a patient's doing well, I still um, monitor. How their, often? Monthly? Three monthly? Um, it depends on the patient, but every three months to six months depends on the marker, depends on what was abnormal before, like Stephanie was saying. Okay. Also possible or routinely done to monitor the level of the drug, particularly when we take uh, long-term acting drugs like rabulizumab in patients on an individual base. It's not routine. I do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not routine and it's not routine, like widely available. Do you? Oh, sorry. He was asking, like, is it normal to have routine drug level monitoring when patients are on it longitudinally? Um, do you do that? Or do you have access to that? No, I know that it's in the discussion. Yeah. Oh, that would be ideal, right? Is if we had a means of longitudinal monitoring. In this monitoring. way, it can be easily measured, but uh, not on a standard level. Yeah, we don't do it routinely. That would be especially useful for drugs where you don't have the same um, uh, uh, pharmacodynamic um, response. Like ravulizumab, uh, at least many forms of the CH50 assay aren't as um, uh, aren't as nimble, and so you may you might need uh, something like that to um, better ensure that you're controlled. And that was, I was going to ask you that for patients who are on RAV, what are you using? So you're using levels or are you using anything else? We, uh, so I don't know of anyone that has an actual CLIA approved Revelismab level assay. The ECU assay works, but we have not, there, we don't have enough patients or drug to <laughs> to actually make a, a lab developed test for that but um but there are c5 functional assays which i think are helpful because the ch50 plus minus might tell you what you do or don't want to know um so again like this is the we sort of have to create 
the means to monitor these things. But can you elaborate on the C5 functional assay, Stephanie? Are you, are you talking about C5 levels or are you talking about some other? Um, it's a functional assay. So there's like, we'll get a C5 level and then the C5 functional assay. And so then you can sort of see uh, if the function of C5 is blocked within the serum of your patient compared to normal control serum. All right, Christoph, go ahead. We, we, I'm all for testing everything that's available, and I really suffer uh, where I am from from really a, a shortage of that. What do I learn from the drug levels? Why do I need the drug levels? If if I want to decrease frequency and dosing to kind of get away with less drug, I understand. But other than that, why do I need the drug levels? That that's it for me. Okay. Yeah. So I would agree with that, but I don't see any other indication for drug levels. I think it's important yeah. to make that clear. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for me specifically, it is not only for am I able to space it so that my patient isn't getting unnecessary infusions or isn't overly immune suppressed when they don't need to be in order to have yeah, disease yeah. control, or if they're a, quote, non-responder, do they just not have enough drugs? So but, that's for me, but. Yeah, I was just going to oh, say. Yeah. Yes. yeah, okay. So to monitor if they're not responding, if there's enough drug in the system, and then if you want to space it out, I guess, or change the frequency or um, timing. Okay. Uh, what about the risk of infections? Um, do you guys think they're higher with any specific class of drugs? Meredith, Ashley, anybody? Richard, Matthew, anybody who wants to take this question? I, I mean, I think right now the studies are not showing that they're higher with the proximal complement inhibitors. I think you know, we are still very cautious with vaccinating prophylactic antibiotics. So I think we have a pretty good hold on the, doing the best that we can. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of data that shows that the risk of infection is higher. Although with drugs, you know, that don't affect, that allow for the terminal complement to stay intact, those would lower the, the risk of infection. So it could be advantageous. So more of the evacopan kind, but like with proximal, the idea would be that it would still eventually block the terminal pathway if it's blocking proximal. So do you, or some people worry about the C3 inhibitors because it's such a central molecule. Any thoughts on that? Although, you know, it's only for TMA right now and trials, not for complement mediated right now. You're saying which drug? The C3 inhibition, does that bother you? And I think I would treat my patients the same way I would treat my patients who are on eculizumab and ravulizumab. I, I know what the data is on the infection risk, although with all of the big trials for, like the Pegasus trial for PNH and, and Pegsetacoplan, they haven't had any people with meningitis yet. So um, I think the, the risk of not treating with the appropriate drug is higher. And that brings us to another question that comes up often in discussion. To, well, of course, we all know that we vaccinate our patients. The question is, do you vaccinate and keep them on antibiotics as long as they're on the drug? Um, or do you only vaccinate and leave them off antibiotics? And I'd, I'd be interested in just getting um, the audience poll as well on what, what the practices are before the panelists weigh in. How many of you just vaccinate if there's enough time, of course, for others, you would do the antibiotic, but how many of you just leave the patients on with vaccination without antibiotics. Just show of hands would be okay. Vaccination only, no antibiotics. Vaccination only, no antibiotics. Okay, what about the panel? What do you guys do? I just want to hear individual, or what do you suggest? My, my standard of practice is both vaccination and antibiotics. But like Stephanie was saying, we have a pediatric population. So I wonder if that differs from pediatric to adults. I think In we're a fact, little more I've heard cautious. The opposite, I've heard the opposite, Meredith. I've heard pediatric nephrologists say they would only vaccinate and not use antibiotics because it masks if something's happening and they want to know. So I've heard both sides of the coins. It's interesting that the practices do vary a little bit. Um, any other thoughts? Um, with, with, I mean, if the, 
you know, there's pretty good data that the vaccination alone can work. So, um, and, you know, chronic antibiotic use for prophylaxis come with its own issues also with the gut flora and everything. So I'd be cautious with that, but it depends on the patient, I think. Any other thoughts? Vaccination and antibiotics, I think that's kind of what everybody is saying, generally. Just question on the vaccination coming from the low resource setting. What is the actual real risk? So is it that the original um, trial was for, for caution? There has not been any many, you know, meningitis cases and that every trial just keep copy pasting the meningococcal vaccine. In low resource setting, we don't even have the two, two the, all the serotypes and it's a big barrier to make the clinician feel safe. And also mechanistically, why not H flu, why not pneumo, pneumococcal vaccine, which are even more common things. So it just doesn't make sense. And I felt like it just make a lot of regulatory body in the low resource setting hesitant as well to starting these things. And especially if this is just historical copy paste safety data, what I, I don't know back in the days when they originally developed these trials, whether these are real risks or not. So I wanna ask the panel. At least based on um, the earliest eculizumab data, um, both, I don't think in the trials, but in post-marketing um, experience, there's a clear safety signal for C5 inhibition and nicereal infections. I, I would say any encapsulated organism, so H. flu, pneumococcus, according to um, local ACE, your local guidance, ACIP guidance, et cetera. But um, uh, there's there's definitely um, a significantly increased risk, at least based on what we know from C5 inhibitors. Um, whether we can say with the not more the newer agents, if that risk is um, is similar, I think we just don't have the amount of time of post marketing surveillance to know that. Um, I think uh, a comment I was going to make before it also depends on how. Um, how much inhibition you have with that drug. So um, it's not an all or none with many of these agents. The complement system is knocked down to 10% activity or 5%, which may be enough to suppress disease, but it may not be so profoundly suppressed. I guess to your, back to your point that the risk of um, uh, encapsulated organisms may be, may be less if the these novel, these newer agents coming out are, aren't as um, aren't as potent. That I guess comes with the it's added risk. I think also you could look at the genetic experiments. So the occasional families that segregate factor D mutations and are deficient in factor D, and then the families that are, have low or deficient levels of factor I, and and just read those case reports and. The theme, the theme throughout those case reports is when people get sick, it's with infections and they'll get meningitis and, you know, maybe when you're 10 or you're 20, but they're getting sick. We do have a question from the virtual audience. If you discontinue anti-C5, how long do you continue the antibiotics for? We wait for the CH50 to normalize. Any other practices? Okay. All right, I think that's all we have for the workshop today. I really wanna take a moment and thank our panelists, of course, and our sponsors, Novartis and Alexion, for generously supporting this, which is what we've been able to bring this together to you all. And thank you also to our virtual attendees. They've been patient and we've had about 55 or so attend. So we had a good 90 people attend and hopefully